two times 10 to the fifth, 200,000 years ago. That's the last 10 to the last page. And now watch. This is a picture lifted from Scientific American. It is to say that in Central Africa, there existed about 60,000 years ago a population of humans from which emerged subpopulations that over the period from 60,000 to 10,000 years ago populated the planet. Our species as a planetary interactor with the planet's systems is only 10,000 years old. Only 10,000 years old. That's the Holocene era, which coincidentally or not is the only period we have in the last couple of hundred thousand years which is flat for global systems. So we are at the end of a 10,000 year period of being a global species, which in the last couple of hundred years has allowed us an enormous population expansion in a geological system which is itself over. Kind of shocking. In this context, some of us are African American, but we are all American Africans. Everyone came out of Africa only as late as 10,000 years ago or as early as 60,000 years ago. No time at all in biological terms. So when Jeremy says all our DNAs are very similar, only one tenth of a percent difference, that embeds the fact that this leaving of Africa is so recent. More important than that we're similar, people now in Africa contain the versions of DNA present among all of us. African, Central Africans are genetically the most diverse people in the world because all the rest of us are subpopulations of Central Africa, carrying subpopulations of DNA versions. So not only are we all American Africans, but we are all different American Africans to the extent we look different from each other. That's human difference. It's not a matter of what continent you're from, but from, it is a matter of when you left Africa and how north or south you went from there. Okay. Now, the missing picture would say, coincidentally, we became planetary just in time for the last 10,000 years as the glaciers thawed and we go into the period we're in. The Anthropocene is the end of that. Forget that. So, human dreams of perfection, I would hypothesize, began sometime unknown to us, when ritual began and burials began and dreams of immortality began, sometime not much before the Holocene 10,000 years ago. And they began, or they were taken from Africa to cover the planet. But not much before. So let's look back. Somewhere toward the last sentence would be the emergence, as I'm trying to say, of a mental world of languages and texts and imagined creatures. This girl is Alice. This is not a person. This is a mental construct. The lady drawn by Lewis Carroll is dead 100 years. But we know Alice because we live in our minds. And our minds are free of the constraints of DNA, which include mortality. Ideas live on the way sequences live on, but without sequence constraints. There is the burden. The world of imagination is new, but the Anthropocene is newer. Darwin, with his imagination to see natural selection, and Lewis Carroll, with his Alice, both lived and died quickly in the period at the end of that last sentence. There's a period. That's not a geological period. That's a period. And that's it. Race emerges at the same time. The problem, the idea of race, like the idea of natural selection, is a modern idea. It's just wrong. OK. Darwin did not concern himself, I think, in a useful way with our topic. But he did have a very, very powerful idea for the emergence of ideas through natural selection. The mind, he said, well, it crapped out on this slide, but he said the mind is an excrescence of the brain. That is to say, mental states emerge from the brain. Having no DNA in hand, he could not say what I can say, that ideas are freed from their inherited, from the DNA that constructs the brain that has them. Any mind can have any idea. So this is Darwin's idea. The structure of the human brain is encoded in human DNA. Ideas are not encoded in DNA. They are learned or they are imagined. So any normal brain 
can have any idea and pick it up by teaching and learning. Correctness, accuracy, reality are not subtexts of that, not constraints on what I said. We are more free than we can handle sometimes. So this is how that fact played out, I would say, for the Holocene era when we covered the planet out of Africa. From the outside, from the world of nature, our minds interacted with all other species through the DNA of all other species. That is to say, we created agriculture, animal husbandry, the taming of the planet through our minds. We affected the DNA of other species. We, by domesticating, have ideas about animals and ourselves, like slavery, which is the effect of the DNA of species on our minds. That's how it looks from the outside for the period of the Holocene. The Anthropocene part of that is simply the insertion of science. Science directly addresses itself to the DNA of all species, and the DNA of all species informs science. The Human Genome Project is an example of that. And indeed, we drive natural selection. We kill thousands of species, millions of species for our purposes. We breed the ones we like. The biomass of what we eat is a huge fraction of the biomass of what it would, uh, of the planet compared to what it would be without us. We pick, we choose. Human selection dominates natural selection because it's so much faster. That's the Anthropocene loop. But the Holocene loop persists. From the inside, from the inside, we are still out of Africa, a primate species taking over. Me, I am at the center, stuff about me, my stuff, the stuff I hate orbits about me, and otherwise there's nothing. The problem of the imagination is it is not a species-sensitive part of our species. We think about ourselves as individuals. So what are our choices? Now, I turn directly to the matter of race. The first choice we have is to face our history in this Anthropocene era since Darwin, since 200 years. Here's a quote of how we are governed, self-governed by our constitution. And you'll recognize it. It says, basically, if we're going to make a Congress, the number of representatives from a given state will be determined, and the amount of taxes paid will be determined by the population numbers, which will be the number of free persons, including people who are serfs de facto, excluding Native Americans because they're not citizens, they're members of other countries at that time, and including three-fifths of all other persons. That is, a southern state, a slaveholding state, had a larger number of Congress people, men, men, congressmen, by three-fifths of the number of slaves held by the people who could vote, by the men who could vote. This is a powerful idea, reducing some people to the level of three-fifths of a person in an abstraction, but not a person at all in terms of the fact that they were po profoundly not only unable to vote, but unable to decide their fate at all. They were slaves. That's our history. Do you appreciate that this means some people who came out of Africa to Europe 50,000 years ago take other people from Africa and make them not human beings and call it the natural order of things. That's a bad idea. And it is a false idea about human difference which informed the fates of the ancestors of all of us in this room to a profound degree. I don't think we currently confront this history properly. I really don't. I don't think this is a matter of tolerance and niceness. This is a matter of wholehearted rejection which still has not occurred. So that's the first choice I think we make on the matter. We are stuck together as we rot out the planet, and it's way past the proper time to admit that we need everybody's help to stabilize it. We cannot imagine fellow human beings as less than people. OK. But there's a prior issue. That is the choice to face facts in general. Here's a study in, from Science Magazine four years ago. People in the thousands are asked in 34 countries, what do you think of evolution? Do you accept it? Do you not? Blue is true. Gray is not sure. Red is false. Iceland, largely uh, people take it run down the countries to Greece, 
and you see people are still a little more than half saying it. So where's the United States? There's the United States. Right? Majority of people either do not accept or know that evolution can't be so. If evolution can't be so, then in fact slavery is reasonable then in fact I can decide that by the difference between myself and someone else, one of us is not really human. Then Jeremy's one-tenth of one percent DNA difference doesn't matter because we were created by those differences differently, intrinsically. Then genetic determinism is possible. This is our political problem as fellow citizens of that majority of Americans. Second is not to not know the facts, but to ignore them when you know them. Here is a study from anthropology of life expectancies on the vertical axis versus age. So if everyone is, by fact of birth, alive at the beginning, you see that for people who live without what we would call Holos uh, Anthropocene civilization, people living in New Guinea and other places as hunter-gatherers, or wild chimps, or the data for Sweden 250, 300 years ago, what you find is humans have, in the absence of medicine, a rapid fall in the first five years because of childhood diseases, and then a stable plateau, so that about the life expectancy, if you make it through five years, without medicine, is something between 50 and 60, 65 years, whereas chimps die 40 years early. We are a long-lived species. I'll talk later if anybody wants to know about ideas why that's so, but our biological age in the wild, so to speak, is about 60. Now, here's the world's population by color, okay? Region by color. Size of the circle is the amount of people. Up, and you can't see the picture. What it is to say is where poor people live. And the billion and a half people who live on a buck a day or so live largely in Africa and in Asia. Very few in the Europe, North America, Mid-South America region. The choice we have is to ignore, which we do very well, the fact that right now, if you plot, you recognize Africa as the dark blue, Life expectancy on the vertical axis against income per capita four years ago, you see that at the lower left, we, that is to say everybody in this room and our country and the developed world at the top of this curve, allow people to have stolen from them 10, 20, 30 years of their biological lifetime by where they are born. The arrow on the right is the cost of tuition at Columbia. Um, now, what does that mean? Look where they are from. They are our ancestral descendants. They hold the genetic treasure of our species. These are not only our relatives, these are our, the people who never left home, and we let them die. Because they're not us, for the most part. Because they're black, because they're biologically predestined to be different from us. That's what ignoring a fact looks like when you know better because you know about race being real. So to summarize, humans are a single young African species. There's the small, I had the same slide as Jeremy said, one base pair in a thousand is different from person to person. This is something I hope if you remember one thing, you remember this. Nobody can say which versions of the human genome will be essential for the survival of our species or of life on this planet. If we do not protect human diversity for its own sake, we undercut the future of everything. Because the environment for a species like ours includes all other species, another great idea of Darwin. And that means that dreams of human domination, like race, all must threaten the survival of all species. All dreams of perfection of our species threaten the long-term survival of all species. That's why I started with this poster. And to end, we can conclude that the idea of race is no more than an 